how would you like to know which data that you need to scale your business with ads? Hi, I'm Jared Kraus, host of the Buying Online Business Podcast, and today I'm speaking with Nima Gadide, who is the co-founder of Pear Mill, a tech-powered growth studio that combines the power of artful creativity with precision targeting on major digital platforms. Now, Nima is an expert in growth experimentation, organizational design, operating systems, agile software engineering, funnel optimization, and user design. Plus, he hosts his own podcast, so he is a great speaker. Now, in this podcast episode, Nima and I specifically talk about how he was able to scale a hotel company to 80% capacity through COVID with paid ads. We talk about how they order a business to see if the business is actually scalable before they work with somebody. Then we talk about how they scale ads based on data sets and which data sets you actually need to scale the business. Then we talk about ad creators like videos and images and how they create ads, images and videos based on data alone and what that process actually looks like, which I think is important and fascinating. I also share some of my philosophies on this podcast episode about investing in advertising in order to collect data and why we all need to do it uh, because the data is so, so valuable. We also talk about what actually nets better on a cost per acquisition basis search advertising or paid social and why. There's so much more in this podcast episode that we unpack, but if you own an e-commerce business or a SaaS business or are wanting to run ads on your business, this is a great episode for you. You're absolutely gonna love it. Do you wanna build or grow your content website? Niche website builders have helped hundreds of people to take their content websites from a few hundred dollars per month to over tens of thousands of dollars per month with crafted content creation, buying age domains and link building strategies. These strategies have helped people increase their traffic, authority, monthly earnings, and their website valuation too. Head to nichewebsite.builders forward slash B-O-B forward slash to get 10% off any link building or 10% more from their content creation services. That's nichewebsite.builders forward slash Bob forward slash. I'll put a link in the description too. Hello, Nima. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. When I first got introduced to you and what you do, you do some pretty cool stuff. And I wanted to unpack what Pear Meal does, um, not just for not just for myself to under to understand and learn it a bit more, but for everybody listening. So, what is what is your company Pear Meal? What do you do? What's the you know the the goal when somebody comes and works with you. Um, yeah, I'm happy to walk you through that. So we are what we call a paid growth studio. What that really means is we bring on essentially three separate disciplines together to help companies grow. We bring in sort of traditional growth marketing, ad operations, media buying uh, discipline. We bring on creative production, creative agency discipline, and engineering and data science disciplines together. We build a, social, a, a platform to help companies scale. The platform is really a combination of process plus some technology for reporting and understanding the ad spend across the brands that are helping um, to help companies scale and sort of maybe 50% of our ad spend is consumer, a little bit over 50% is consumer, either e-commerce or consumer SaaS, and the rest is marketplaces and some uh, B2B SaaS, kind of like all over the place in terms of clients that we work with, but uh, the process is essentially the same. Yeah, cool, cool. Uh, So I want to unpack more of that um, in how you sort of use data with creatives and your framework for uh, that you mentioned in your own content on your site. But before we hit the record buttons, you mentioned something pretty cool that you help brands buy other brands by working out what sort of brands would be a good fit for them, right? So uh, a lot of people here listening are wanting to buy businesses and have thought about the ideology of, well, if I need to grow a business, I can buy clients through paid advertising and marketing and stuff like that. But you can also buy an audience via buying a business. So how have you, what are some of the things that you have done to help other brands acquire the right businesses to put underneath them and and, and scale. That's very broad, but yeah, we'll, I guess so, we'll unpack that. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get it, get through it. So the way that we can help with these types of things, right? We just understand uh, what I call sort of auction dynamics of these paid channels, right? So Facebook and Instagram and Google and Bing and all these major institutions that you can advertise on all have their own flavor of the same 
thought process on how to price an auction and price an impression, right? So what we can help with, and this is you know, some of our clients are these types of companies that buy other e-commerce brands and scale them, is try to get an understanding of, is there some clear path for growth in a certain market for that specific brand? And really what we can do is if you, let's say, have access to a Facebook ads manager, you can get a sense of, okay, well, if they're going after audience X, the size of the audience is a million people, and we think the current conversion rate will hold, um, how, how much more revenue can we generate from this specific audience? And can we expand that on the audience in a way that will maintain the current customer acquisition costs so then we can scale the brand's top line over an X number of months? Um, and so... You know, it takes, I'm overly simplifying something that does take a while, uh, but it, that's kind of the, the, the gist of it is, is there space in the auctions at their current sort of rate, or is there a way to increase the size of the auction? This is like a, a thing within Facebook and Instagram specifically is if you're going after larger auctions, you're going to end up getting cheaper clicks. So is there a way to increase the size of the auction where it's still relevant? It's still people that could put, buy the product. But you're going at it in a way that as a larger potential audience on the platform. Um, and the reason you end up getting cheaper clicks is to do with the machine learning models underneath it. We don't have to get into the details of that, but you end up getting cheaper clicks the larger the audience targeting audience is on Facebook right now. So it, there is an easy path for us to sort of estimate um, this space. And then on paid search, it's much easier, right? They literally give you this metric called the percentage of impression share that you have on a certain keyword. And if the brand's been, let's say, operating for a couple of years and they have a few keywords already out there that they're spending on, uh, you just have to look about around, okay, how competitive are they? Is there space to grow? How much of the share of the impressions are we currently sort of buying to get? And if we buy 100% of those, what does that growth look like? Is it going to be still sustainable in terms of price? Because the bid increases as I try to increase my share because other brand, brands are willing to also compete with me on it. So there is some calculus that has to go behind that. But putting these two things together, you get a sense of, okay, you've been spending a couple of years already on Facebook and, and, and Google. We, we can get a sense of how much further can you do it without fundamentally changing the approach you're doing to advertising. Maybe your brand has to get a lot more uh, attention to it and uh, you need to Use more products and more SKUs or whatever, right? This is like a baseline of your current strategy. Can it scale a little bit further? How much further can it go? And it's a very good snapshot to take of brands if you're trying to buy them. And if you're, let's say, promise your investors or yourself that you need to get uh, a 10% return within a 12 month uh, period, then this is an easy way to get a sense of, okay, actually, I'm going to be on par about 10 to 15 for this specific brand and then create a model around it, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's essentially seeing if the business is scalable and the only way that you can see if a business is scalable is through the data. And those those main data points are what is your cost per acquisition um, and then your, your audience size and can that be expanded, right? Uh, that's really cool. And I guess that doesn't just go for buying, seeing if you're going to buy a business and see if it's scalable. Uh, when we look at different types of business models like the uh, same would go for e-com and SaaS in terms of that sort of paid advertising, but also how much traffic is available to be acquired through content if you're running a, a content mm -hmm. site. Yeah, so I think it's pretty cool, not just if you're going to buy a business or buy, acquire a brand under another brand, uh, but also if you've just, I guess you go through that process for every, anybody that comes to you that's like, hey, can you help me grow my business? That's probably the first point of call, right? Is Would that be it? Like, oh, yeah. This at, is one of the reasons we do free audits is because we want to know if there is enough space for you to grow so then we mm. can be part of that future, right? Um, a lot of maybe agencies would charge you for just taking a look at the account. We'll take a look at the account, give you a ton of feedback without even charging you for it if you're part of our sales process because we do want to see a certain growth rate. We don't have a lot of clients. Like our whole model is to just have sub 20 clients at any given point, uh, but they should be or soon should be spending millions of dollars. Um, and for us to see if you have the potential to get there, um, we need to sort of take a look at these metrics ourselves. And we're pretty honest about that upfront, right? 
Yeah. Uh, we'll tell yeah. you, hey, we'll just say no to you, but we'll regardless give you uh, hopefully a, a reasonable amount of feedback on the accounts and what we would do if we were to take over. But there's a chance we'll look at the account and say, we just don't think we can help uh, or there's not enough space for us to grow your brand within the next 12 months. And it doesn't make sense for us. Um, and, and it's kind of like a hedge fundy way to run a growth shop, right? Um, a growth marketing shop. But it's the way that works best for us, I think, because one is we get to work with some really great brands who are scaling rapidly and we get to be part of the journey. And the second thing is it's just more stable. For yeah. us. We make very long commitments to the brands. We've been working with some of them for years. And you know, I don't know if you've been in this part of the world, but uh, of, of technology and specifically advertising, you end up having a lot of folks that get jaded by having to work on new clients all the time um, and they don't get to really feel like they have ownership. And so we've completely eliminated that to some extent. And so that, that's kind of the model for us. Um, it is a little bit harder in that we have to we kind of compete with folks that have a lot of money on the other side as well. And that becomes a little bit harder to scale your efforts, but it's worked for us over the past <laughs> few years. You're using a, a long-term game plan rather than short-term, let's get anybody in the door and make them a bit of money. And then, you know, you know, the life cycle of the growth of the business may not last well into the future, which means you have to go back to the drawing board and get more clients and just... Um, can be messy, right? <laughs> totally. And, and I think like, really, if you think about it, all these networks like Facebook and Google, if you're spending on them, they are caring about longevity now a lot more. It's literally, at least on Facebook's end, one of the probabilities and how they price your auctions is how likely is this user uh, that's seeing this ad is to come back to not only the platform Facebook, but also to your site in the future. So mm -hmm. there is also an advantage of thinking long term for each brand that that's going out there uh, on how do you build relationships with folks that you're selling your products to such that they keep coming back and they use your products and services and your community and whatever else is you're putting out there. These networks are trying to incentivize that because that's how we end up building more stewardship based companies that are trying to build very good uh, software or very good products out there for people to use. Right. Yeah, I think I think everybody listening to the podcast is is probably had it drummed into themselves enough by me saying, let's not just about trying to make a sale. What comes before the sale is building a relationship because that's where the trust comes <laughs> um, from the, how strong the relationship is built. So I think, I think that's a really good point. I wanted to talk about the, the framework that you guys sort of use to navigate through advertising with Facebook and Google, like to sort of unpack it a little bit and maybe how you used it for say uh, a brand that you helped help scale so you've got a few you've got five different things right you got ideation prioritization implementation analysis and then systemization so if we were to use a brand that you have helped scale that has got you pretty proud of working with them and you got them a great result and they're happy um would you be able to walk us through like how does you know you first start with ideation when they come to you uh, is and this is and is this after you've sort of done your audit to see if it's see if that brand is scalable. Yeah, yeah, I can walk you through an example. And yeah, ideation essentially starts after the audit. So let's say we you come to us and say, hey, I want to scale my brand. We'll take a look and say we think we can help. Um, and we go through this process on a monthly basis, um, and I'll walk you through it. But um, cool, there is like a general version of it that is applied in my in micro ways. So that general version you just talked about, there is ideation. Mm -hmm experimentation and analysis and systematization is essentially what is known as sort of the, the growth experimentational process. You know, there's uh, growth leaders like Sean Ellis and Brian Belfour, Andrew Chan, and these folks that have built some of these Silicon Valley companies have built this general process. It's quite simple to think about, right? You're just coming up with ideas, you experiment with them, uh, see what the result is like, use the results to build a system around that idea, right? Um, but yeah. the problem with this yeah. general approach is it's hard to actually implement. Uh, so let me walk you through some examples of how we do it and, and how we actually falls into our, our business. So on a monthly basis, we have a week we call the sprint planning week. Um, and we're, we've stolen some of these concepts from engineering because it, they also, uh, I believe, are, are really just experimenting at scale where we try to come up with all the different ideas we have on what we could do to improve the account. Right. So there might be what we call targeting or structural ideas. And that is, you know, how the campaigns or ad sets and ad groups are structured in the Facebook and Google accounts. Um, it could be targeting ideas. You know, what I just told you, hey, maybe we need to increase the audience size by 20% to see what happens. There's a bunch of ideas in that area. Uh, 
there's a second lever, which is creative. So we're going to come up with a bunch of creative ideas on how do we try to pitch this brand in a slightly different way? What are the past learnings that we can use to uh, iterate on and all this sort of stuff? So that's another lever. And the last one is data, uh, which is what are the learnings we have uh, around what works and what doesn't in terms of maybe the conversion rates of different ad groups, audiences, or um, uh, first and last touch attribution that we've gone across the board, how can we use that to then run experiments? Um, and, then, and then there's an area that's newer, we still fa it falls within data for us, is that the signal you pass back to these ad networks. So if you tell Google that I want this type of user, essentially you take Facebook, I want this type of user by telling them that they convert it at the right part of your product. They will sub-target your audience for you in such a way that they are hoping to get people that are more likely to perform that action. A simple example is we have a client named Sonder, and I'll walk you through a bunch of examples across these four levers, but let's start with a data one. Sonder is a distributed hotel. Uh, we've been working with them right, since right before the pandemic. Um, so they, they had a tough year, and the first year we worked with them because the pandemic was happening, but uh, and, and they were a hotel. So um, they were able to actually maintain their their margins quite miraculously by changing their hotels to be sort of shelters for doctors and nurses that they need, needed to be away from their families. And they did that effectively and did it through paid social advertising. But there is really no great targeting for, hey, I want to target nurses and doctors in a certain city that maybe have families and are on the front lines of COVID, right? It just yeah. doesn't exist on, and, and are looking for hotels right now. It just doesn't exist on Facebook, right? <laughs> so what do you have to do? You have to essentially target everyone in that city. So the targeting was anyone in the cities in which Sonder operated, right? And mm -hmm. then you have to tell Facebook, I want this action, which for them at the time, they wanted longer stay, term stays. So we were optimizing towards a long stay purchase event. Mm -hmm. uh, instead mm -hmm. of any purchase or any booking, we were optimizing towards a specific type of booking. So what this taught Facebook over time was that, okay, we're looking for clearly this persona, it was doctors and nurses, et cetera, that was looking for this thing, which is long stays. Over maybe a, a couple of months period after we spent quite a lot of money to feed the algorithm, right? We were able to bring co costs down dramatically and the ROAS started ballooning and became quite a great account, but it was a very hard period not just for their business, but also trust for, of their team to know that we're, we know what we're talking about. It's hard to see it because you're feeding the algorithm in that portion of time so until you money, hit yeah. the scale that you need and it works, yeah. right? Um, so I that like was to, a very I clear experiment. Pause, can I just pause you there? I just want people to understand this when they are doing paid ads. What you're doing is you are putting money in to collect data at the start, right? That's all that you're doing. And when people... I think people like if they're trying to run it themselves or they're going through an agency and they realize like I've just spent so much money, I haven't really got the results. Yeah, that's pretty typical at the start because you are just giving money to Facebook and Google to get data to work out if it's going to work and how will it work and what are the right ads that you should be optimizing, right? So I just wanted to jump in there, Nima. Sorry for cutting you off, but yeah, I think no, it's a very important point. <laughs> <laughs> um, and especially over the past year, since the iOS 14 changes, this has yes. become even more of a reality uh, because unfortunately, Facebook's algorithm still needs the same amount of data, but it's not getting less of it. So mm -hmm. that means you have to just pay more to get to the scale in which the algorithmic sort of optimizations or CAC reductions come into play, right? And so, yeah, that, that's sort of the gist of the overall process. And I can walk you through an example of creative and how that works. Right. Um, for the data piece, that's simple, right? Hey, we want to see if we can use a different signal to see if we can reduce CAC. So we're going to create a different event, optimize towards that event, wait a certain number of weeks um, and see if the change, if the dynamics of the account change. Right. But for the creative, it's actually much harder. I would say it's not as clear. Right. This is um, this is for ad creatives, right? For images and videos. Yeah. So yeah, ad creative thought... that could be images or videos that you're producing on yeah. Facebook or Instagram. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we do use the general, say, like similar process, right? We come up with a bunch of ideas, we run them, we try to see if they worked or not, um, and then use the learnings to go on to do the next step. But the part that's much harder, and this is what we've learned over the past few years, is you can't isolate the learnings as much because it's really hard to 
uh, let's say, produce a video 30 different ways with all the small nuances and the differences that you would want mm. and then run that same idea 30 different times because it's just going to cost you millions of dollars, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, you'll yeah. have to isolate every ad, run a, a enough money behind it that it gets conversions so you see what the conversion rates are, what the CAC per ad is and all this sort of stuff. So it's just going to take you a couple million dollars for every great idea you have because let's say it's like a 15 second or 30 second video and there is hundreds of different variations of it that you could come up with. So what we've tried to do now is um, still attempt to do that and isolate as much as we can, but we do it essentially based on a structural way where we try to test out the simplest versions of things first. Right. We'll start with like an image ad that just is, let's say, for this specific brand, Sonder. Uh, it's just the apartment and nothing else. Right. And well, that in itself, there are so many ways to think about how do I shoot the apartment mm -hmm. before the user sees it. And we went yeah. through quite a lot of iterations of that, maybe, maybe hundreds and hundreds of different ways of shooting apartments <laughs> until we got to a point where we understood there was three things that need to be in the shot. For it to work yeah and there were things around okay this like the windows have to show there should be kitchen countertop in it uh high ceilings there's a bunch of like visual aspects that kind of were the thematic things that were in all the high performers right yeah so that's that's level one and then you grab those learnings to build okay what if i put the discount code or the discount amount or the price of the of the hotel or their logo or maybe right before you see the uh, photo of, of the apartment, someone tells you about the value props or maybe the value props are over it, right? There's so many different ways now I can build on top of the core of what works, right? Yeah. And so you build these learnings and compound them over time. And if you go and look at Facebook ads on the Facebook ads library for Sonder, you'll see wildly different ideas there. But the core of it is that we know what, how to take the shoots of the, of the apartments. And then we built so many different learnings on top of that idea, right? Mm. Um, it's much harder to nail. I'd say it took us many years to master this and it's like a constant learning for us. And it's, it's also very hard to get people that are doing production of creative who are interested in this way of thinking, which has been <laughs> the hardest part for us, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I it's imagine. not just knowing that this is a thing. You have to also find the videographer who yeah. thinks that's interesting and they want to play around with it. Yeah, 400 times, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that, the combination of those two things is where the magic on creative happens. It's just very hard to find the right mm. people and the right process to make it work. But when you do nail it, it works extremely well because you essentially go after the people that want your product. They want it the way you are presenting it. Um, and they end up wanting, you know, buying and discovering what, what you're trying to sell. And, and it's, it's, it works sort of perfectly for everybody involved. Yeah, I think it's a great process. Uh, if I come back to what I was saying before around when you first start running ads, paid ads, you're putting out, paying money, you're investing money just to collect data. And that's what you're doing throughout this process and then honing it in to perfect, only put in the things that you need within the short time frame that you can have the ad in front of that person and give them exactly what they, they need to see to be able to have a connection with that video or image in order to go further and start that relationship. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. And you know, you only have so much time and money to spend to learn these things, of course, mm. but you do have to spend it in order to get that information. So you understand what works and what doesn't, right? There, there's a lot of nuances around creative in itself because now the way we think about creative is that it's just a lever for targeting, right? Um, and that the right person can look for a way of looking at the same brand and buy it versus you might have a different taste and sens aesthetic sensibilities compared to me and you might click on different ads even though we're both in the same target market for mm -hmm. let's say brand x mm -hmm. uh, so not only do you have to figure out what is the composition of these videos and images that work it's also okay what are the different versions of those that work for the different parts of your clientele and your potential audience and so there's an infinite amount of things to test yeah. and you do have to spend money to get the data back to see if it work or not. But hopefully you're sort of um, doing it in a way that you aren't wasting too much money, right? Even with Sandra as an example, you know, they were profitable within month one on the ad spend um, 
or not profitable, but basically breaking even. And then now right. they're, they're doing quite well um, many times over. But in the beginning, it was a big commitment for us and them to uncover this and unlo- unlock this to make it work, given the situation was dire. You know, um, their other channels had completely stopped giving them uh, business at the time, which makes sense. Um, yeah, I think to, to sum it up, I think you're correct. It's, it, it isn't to say that you're just going to go out there and waste money, though. Um, no, it's money is useful. It's, it's, it's an investment that will give you the information you need in order to figure out how, how to make it profitable. Yeah, I always like to use that as a principle for, for all things, even when somebody's like, you know, I'm not into starting businesses, which is why I tell people to buy businesses because 90% of startups fail. But even if somebody was to start a business, what you're doing is you're investing your time to work out what's going to work. And you're just investing that time to collect that data. Uh, but what I, you know, I think it, it covers, it goes across all sort of fields. I think it's more of a philosophy um, in investing to be able to collect the data, which is absolutely critical to have the confidence to be able to scale, right? If you're taking on an investor to grow your business, you want to be very confident that what return you can get. And that can only be based off the data that you have for scalability. So tell us a bit about the results. It could be figures, it could be bookings, it could be anything that Saunda was able to get through through that period of working with you, especially through COVID, which is, I think you, you did exceedingly well to, to help a company grow in the hotel space over COVID. <laughs> for sure. I, I mean, I, I don't think I can share exact numbers, but I can tell you that they had close to 80% occupancy within uh, month one of working with us, which was right around the pandemic. And they maintained that. Um, Great. And those, these, pop, these numbers are public, so you can look them up because um, they've just IPO'd actually in a couple of months ago. So they've gone through a, a massive growth spurt actually over the last few years. So it has been a good couple of years for them, even given the, the, the situation and the market has changed. They uh, are quite a nimble team and were able to sort of remarket their company for that period as a way to help people survive through the pandemic better. And now they're going back to their sort of bread and butter, which is helping business travel and travelers sort of find space while they're staying in different places, but their average stay has increased and, and uh, they're scaling quite rapidly now. Excellent. Congrats. Well done. Really well done, especially through that, to that period of time. Um, I'm sure that first month would have been quite tedious. I wanted to ask you about the differences in Google and Facebook and Instagram and why would you lean into one or the other depending on the different brand? I have my own ideologies around that based on tents and where the audience is for that particular or how the audience likes to consume content as well. Uh, but how do you how do you go about choosing, all right, let's check out these platforms or which platforms to test for which brand? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And you have, you've nailed some of them immediately, right? Um, if we think that there is existing intent for what you're selling, search is an obvious path. And you can, mm. the good news about search is also you can just look up if there is intent for what you're trying to sell. Right? There's keyword planners yeah. and um, plenty of companies that do the analytics there. Um, the problem with search, even if you have intent, is that there is a limited amount of it. Um, mm. You're finding people who are at the bottom of the funnel almost. Like they're literally looking um, to buy now. And sometimes they're, they're maybe researching, but the intent level in general is much higher than anyone you would find in, a dis- in what I call sort of discovery-based channels. So these could be Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. These are where you're sort of passively consuming content mm. and you could stumble upon something, right? An app yeah. that tells you about X product that you may be in the market for, a couple of months down the line or even tomorrow because you didn't know that existed until today, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So search's problem is scale um, because there's only so much, so many people that know what to look for even. Forget about look for exactly what you're selling. And so I do encourage people to look at search. I've seen only a handful of businesses be able to scale search. The problem, and then the reason for that is, you know, you're, you're maybe selling a couple products and there's only a handful of keywords you can sort of buy the traffic from and they have a maximum. The businesses that are able to scale search are the ones that are either constantly generating new SKUs or new products, or they're mm-hmm. fundamentally shaped in a way that gives them an advantage on that channel. So a good example here is probably something like bookme.com, right? Um, yeah. Every combination of city plus destination plus dates, right? They're, those are like so many different sets of keywords they can go after. In fact, they're, I think, yeah. are the number one advertiser on, on Google ads. And they have the biggest team in turn. They have like 70 people or something like that on Google's side that just help yeah. their team because they spend yeah. billions or something like that. Um, so 
that business is just primed to be excelling at search. Um, mm. But other businesses might not be because they don't have these like obvious generative content that they can use to run search ads towards, right? Um, yeah. And so for and then for on the on the face discovery channel side or paid social plus maybe YouTube and those channels where you're passively consuming content, I do think it's exactly as you said. Are they the, in the right place, right? If you're selling to people who are younger, maybe you should try TikTok and Snap first before you try Facebook and Instagram. TikTok especially has I would say, um, you know, quote unquote, stolen a lot of our budgets from Facebook to, to, to TikTok. We do TikTok as well, but we, we've shifted a lot of our budgets to TikTok because it just works, mm. right, for a specific yeah, yeah. Su- subset of brands. Um, so you have to think about audience a lot. And then, um, yeah, if you have no intent, it's obviously you have to go on the paid social channels. Um, and then you have to be aware of there's a lot of competition there. So you have to find a way to stand out. I wanted to ask around the acquisition cost, um, cost per acquisition between the different ones because search is like somebody's like, I'm typing in where to buy a, a watch or something like that. Um, will the, because somebody's pretty close to purchasing it with the high intent from search, would you typically see a lower cost per acquisition by a search than say with uh, these social platforms or is it just dependent on the business the services and yeah. products and everything like that if, if you put a gun to my head i'd say yes <laughs> I, would, I would say there's a lot of nuance there right uh, yeah, if you so could much. be in a very competitive market such that the keywords are so expensive to pay for the clicks are so expensive that mm-hmm. actually paid social is a better path uh, a good example in that the booking.com example is that hopper um, is competing quite well with booking because they're just doing social well and booking and the, some of the biggest travel sites were just not spending on social. So there was a lot of space mm-hmm. in that area and they were able to compete and capture a lot of the, uh, an audience. So um, it does depend on your market, uh, but yes, it should be cheaper on search, assuming that it's not super competitive and um, you're able to capture some of the, some of the clicks. Um, and I guess it depends and, and on there how are, good your remarketing is as well. <laughs> totally. Like you, and, like and, you oh yeah, def- Alpha, yeah. And there's different levels of intent on, on Google, right? If I'm searching, you know, top coffee brands of 2022, that's some intent. I'm looking for coffee. But if I'm searching how to deliver coffee to my door tomorrow, mm-hmm. that's a different level of intent. I want the product now. Right. So it also does depend on the level of intent. So those obviously higher levels of intent search keywords or phrases are going to be more expensive. The ones that are, um, or, or have high, lower conversion rates, which means you have to do retargeting. Maybe they are less expensive, but the overall cost still could be too expensive because they were retargeting strategy, but the lower funnel, more very high intent sort of sets of keywords could be more expensive, but higher conversion rate, which up to ultimately could have a lower CAC, right? So it really just does depend on what, what you what space you're in and, and what the cost dynamics are. Yeah, cool. Nima, thank you so much for coming on and having a chat. Uh, hugely beneficial. Um, so many, so much value in in this conversation. Where can we send people to find out more about Pear Mill and, and what you're doing? For sure, yeah. They can find us on pearmill.com um, and send us a note there. We also have a Twitter account, underscore Paramill. Um, and yeah, we're happy to work with brands that are scaling um, and working on paid search and paid social. So feel free to reach out and I'm always happy to answer questions. So hit me up on Twitter. Yeah, perfect. If you have an Amazon business and you want to get off Amazon, <laughs> uh, a lot yeah. of people will listening <laughs> are in that boat. Uh, guys, thank you for listening. If you do have an e-commerce brand or you know somebody who does or is looking to acquire one, please share this podcast episode with them. It will be hugely valuable. It's great for us to grow the show and it's great for you to get that info. So thank you so much. Uh, there'll be links to everything in the show notes below and I'll speak to you guys on the next one. Bye. Hey, YouTube watcher. If you thought that video is good, you should check out this video here on the two best types of websites beginners should buy or check out my playlist on how I made my first 100K from buying websites and how to do due diligence. Check it out, it's an awesome playlist, you'll enjoy it.